make him very, very welcome, Professor Greg Chapatel.
age, I understood that was fiction, but something weird happened. My dad told me that he knows Captain Kirk, that he knows William Shatner personally. And so he actually went to the same high school. And as a kid, I think I was pretty confused. Like, well, here's all this great, amazing things that were happening, going on all over the, the galaxy and visiting all these planets. But my dad knows this guy. So there's something, something real about it. And that gave me um, somehow either a confusion or a sense that this kind of thing is actually possible for me. And so, uh, fast forward quite a few years, how many of you can figure out what I'm holding in my hand? It's a phaser, a real phaser. <laughs> this is this was in the last two movies of phaser, the last two Star Trek movies. Between the movies, I flew it on the space shuttle for, on the last space uh, flight of Endeavor, I flew it to Paramount, and I was able to bring it back um, on the set of the, on the, set of the you know, Enterprise where they were filming. So actually, on the bridge of the Enterprise, with everybody in costume, Spock standing really that close, and we were right next to him and everyone else on the bridge, and I presented it back um, you know, to, um, uh, to, to all of them. And, uh, and then I got to sit in Captain Kirk's chair, and it was pretty cool. <laughs> well, this is cool in really space. <laughs> um, something else happened, though, that in space that was actually interesting for me. Uh, when I was on the space station for a six-month mission, occasionally we get the opportunity to do some kind of special event at, at our request. But one of, the, one of those, I asked if I could speak to William Shatner. So NASA set up a phone call with me and Captain Kirk. And I had this conversation with Captain Kirk from the space station. And the first thing I asked him was, has anybody ever called you from space before? And no, I'm the first person ever to talk to Captain Kirk from outer space. <laughs> and that was very hard to believe. So, so I would fast forward a little bit, just a little bit about the path, path that I went through. Um, we, my family moved to California. I come, this is now a university. And uh, this was the first space shuttle launch. I can kind of tell that the tank does not launch. <laughs> and, um, and I was a freshman. I was, I was just a little older than you guys. Okay, first year at university. And this happened in January of that year. And that was the perfect time for me because it was an opportunity. I had the whole, my whole education ahead of me to do things right. And I called NASA the next day after this launch. And I said, what do I got to do? What do I got to do to do this? And basically what they told me was, you can't pick a specific thing. Whatever you, gotta, whatever you do, just make sure that you do something that you're very passionate about and then just do it to the best of your ability. So that's what I did. And there were a number of things that I did, you know, that were kind of related. I learned how to fly and scuba dive. Um, you know, a lot of um, uh, hiking, backpacking in the outdoors, guitar. These turned out to be things that had to do actually a lot, a lot later with training and flying. But something else happened then at the end of my time at university. This is an astronaut named Hood Gibson. And who, um, what happened with Hood is he, he went to Cal Poly, the same school that I was at for my undergraduate education, California Polytechnic State University. He came and gave a graduation speech. That was the first time I had ever met somebody that had been in space. And he went to the same university that I did. And that was the first indication to me that, wow, it was a real person, really got to do this, and I'm sort of in the same, you know, same path um, that they were in. And so that was very inspirational uh, for me. Um, Later on at my MIT, uh, uh, at Caltech, I did some work at JPL. Um, at MIT, I, I was working at a company called Draper Labs, which did things for NASA. I uh, worked on the Hubble Space Telescope, the Billington Shuttle. Worked on early models of the space station, the space station Freedom. Worked on attitude control for Freedom, and then um, ultimately on the International Space Station. As you heard, I came to Sydney for a couple years after I finished grad school. I um, had a great time here for two years teaching and, and working with students uh, in, in the aero, in the aero just aeronautical engineering back then. And in the meantime, I was applying to NASA. So actually, a lot of my applications to NASA were, were mailed from Australia. I mailed one from Perth, also on vacation, and that one is the one that got me the first interview, actually. Um, I went back to the United States, uh, started working for NASA, basically working in mission control as a flight controller. Uh, this is, you know, the job I had there had to do with my specialty, which was guidance and control. And uh, one thing we did there, this is just a picture of something that, that we did. If you ever watch NASA TV, you ever see a picture of mission control on NASA TV, what you see on the main screen, the picture of the space station, the space shuttle in a certain orientation, now the space station, uh, this is something that was built by students. The reason I have the logos on here is because one of the students from the University of Sydney came with me and worked for a year on this. And other ones came from uh, Texas A&M and built this thing. This 
not just a display. Um, I'm not going into too much detail. It's a simulator. You can predict what's going to happen. You can look a few days from now. You can analyze lighting and, and, and uh, communication coverage, blockage of antenna arrays from um, uh, solar panels, things like that. So you can, you can look ahead and predict and plan a whole situation, plan maneuvers. Um, this was actually built for the crew on board to have situational awareness of where, where we are. And we thought that at that time that, hey, a space station in the 20th you know, century, 21st century, shouldn't just be numbers, it should be a 3D display. We built it for the crew. Turned out the control center loved it so much better than what they had. They replaced it with, with this. And so this is what's actually running on the main screen in Mission Control right now. Um, I'm very proud of this and proud of the students who, who built this. And finally, I got to realize my dream and fly in space. But before doing that, um, there's a lot of training involved. And I just want to share a little bit about that. Um, first of all, how many of you have seen this movie, Armageddon? Okay. Well, here's a funny thing. This movie came out the very night before my training at NASA started. The very first day of training, what happens is, you know, you get together, take a lot of pictures, and, you know, interviews, and things like that as a group. Uh, but I came back from a vacation. Um, this had just come out, and I, and I this is all about astronaut training. And astronaut, I knew they were going to go on the same rule from an asteroid, right? And so I, I wanted to see this movie before I went, I went to my first day of work. And so I actually went to the theater by myself in the middle of the night. It was about midnight, I think, or 11.30. And no one else was there. I was the only one in the theater. But I had to see this before I started you know, my astronaut training the next day. And it turns out there's some things in here that were kind of foreshadowing of some experiences that I might have. Well, I think maybe you'll remember this scene if you saw this. trying to make a comment about how the Russians do things and how they do things, but there is something to this, actually. It was just very funny. So, so we started on our very first day of training. We selected 25 Americans. We had seven international uh, crew members along with us in training. I'm in the back corner over here. Um, but a funny thing happens. The acid, every time there's a new astronaut class, and this is a very, this is a very big one, um, the previous class usually gets to name them. You know, some nickname for the whole class. Everyone else has to have a nickname, too. Individually, and uh, it's just a military thing, right? You gotta have a handle on it. And uh, we tried to circumvent this. We we kind of saw that was coming, and we tried to pick our own name. So so we picked the penguins, um, and the, everyone else in the office changed it to the dodos. <laughs> so the dodos, instead of a, a, a live, cute, cuddly bird that has lots of stuffed animals to mad to go with it, the dodos are you know extinct, flightless bird, right? Which is kind of what they were trying to tell. Anyway, here we are acting as photos, and um, and we got started. So let me tell you a little bit about the training we went through. Um, it's just kind of a quick sequence, but um, but basically we start off with a lot with survival training. This is like this is Sierra School, uh, like the military. This T-38 training, we fly the T-38s to give us practice with real operational environments. A lot of different survival training. Um, oops, let me stop it. Let's see if this will keep. Oh, maybe I stopped it. Sorry about that. So a lot of different uh, uh, survival and leadership and outdoor training. Um, all that backpacking that I did actually came in quite handy. Uh, of course, training in the shuttle um, and simulators. This is winter survival in northern Canada, done by the Canadian Army. Underwater, we live underwater in a habitat for nine days. Uh, it's a similar operational environment. This is in Russia, uh, space and training under, under, uh, underwater, of course. Um, they get to wear a lot of funny costumes. And uh, this is fitting for a spacesuit in Russia, custom made spacesuit. And this training in different countries and different languages, and training as a crew. And then you have also a different kind of training, the training for your family in a way they have to go through this whole journey with you. And so my kids here, they're getting to spend some time in the shuttle simulator, 
and uh, you know, spacesuit training and working with kids. Um, and uh, they came to Russia as well. This is uh, in, a, in a Russian Soyuz simulator. It was, this is uh, fixing the Russian toilet. When I launched, there was actually a problem with the Russian toilet, and my son there is learning how to fix it. The hardest part, really, of the whole thing is saying goodbye to your family because it's going to be for a, a very long time. And that's um, like any other military deployment, that's uh, very challenging. So I got to fly um, first with a, a crew that was bringing up the Japanese experiment module. Uh, this is my crew right here. That's uh, Commander, that's Mark Kelly. His brother, Scott Kelly, is on orbit right now as a twin. They're doing a one year study you might have heard about. We talked about that with the students earlier today. And um, this, so this was bringing up what is the most large, the, the largest and most beautiful module we have on the space station. The Japanese module is really spectacular. It's bigger, uh, newer. The facilities in it are, are really spectacular. The research facilities are really spectacular. And it also has an outdoor platform for experiments outside, which is, which is really amazing. And its own robotic arm. So we brought that up, installed it. Unfortunately, for Japan, uh, Japan would have liked to have had, so they had Aki. Aki on a crew was there to help install it with the shuttle and inaugurate it. And we had a little ceremony and we all had, we had Japanese food and actually ate chopsticks you know, in space, which was kind of fun for the first night for the Japanese module. But Aki was on the shuttle flight. And so, unfortunately for Japan, the first Japanese astronaut to take care of the Japanese um, spaceship on the space station was me. So, <laughs> so I did my best. Uh, I was, our, of course, spending a lot of time learning Russian, being able to speak Russian. So not much I could do. I'm trying to learn Japanese as well. But Aki actually gave me sort of a cheat sheet of things I could say, nice things to say, like, you know, hey, that was great work we did today together. Congratulations. You know. So at the end of each day, I would try to say something nice in Japanese. I think they, they appreciate that. It was a pleasure, though, working with uh, the, Jap the Japanese in the control center there. And later on, they had you know, the first Japanese astronaut to actually do uh, work in there. I ended up doing all the outfitting and, and, and putting things together, kind of like a giant IKEA set, building telescopes and testing out the science facilities in that module. Um, so they left me behind, and I was there with two Russians, uh, Sergei and Oleg. Uh, Sergei was the commander, and uh, the interesting thing about that, I mean, just three of us, uh, this, was, this was a record, uh, really, at that time, for how much space anyone has ever had in space. <laughs> the three of us on this massive space station, with the two on the Russian side, uh, me running all the other parts, which were European, Japanese, and American, that was an amazing amount of, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's like a, um, about 12 buses hooked together. You know, it's a very big space station and uh, a lot of space for us and, and a lot of work as well for three people. But um, the other interesting thing was, this was the first time ever that they put three rookies in charge of a space station. <laughs> Every time before that, you know, it, it's always the case, it was always the case with the shuttle. You fly the experienced people and some rookies, and the rookies would learn from the experienced people, right? And, and you go on. Um, the three of us had never been in space before, and we were left uh, to take care of the space station for six months. So I guess that gave, it had some confidence that we could do that, which was good. Uh, then what happened is, uh, after six months, I went up again a couple of years later. This is the last flight of space shuttle endeavor. This was a spectacular mission. Um, again, Mark Kelly was the commander um, for this one. And uh, we did two things on this mission that were really, uh, you know, really would characterize it. Uh, one of them was we finished building the International Space Station. This was the very last flight to assemble the International Space Station. And we sort of had that ceremony at the end, and we attached the very last part. The other thing was we flew what's called the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, a $2 billion physics experiment, which many of the folks in this room probably know about. We'll just look at that a little bit later. Um, a couple things about these guys. Um, and everybody had to have nicknames. Um, funny thing was, uh, so actually this, I, I mentioned to you guys earlier today, this is Spanky, right? Um, this is a, you know, and we did a lot of things with that name, uh, Spanky. That's his nickname. You know, Spanky, Spank you, Spank the leg, and just it went on and on. He loved it, actually. And, uh, but he's actually got the record for the time and space of any American right now, um, which is uh, more than a year. Um, but that's almost, almost nothing compared to the Russian with the most amount of time. Um, um, Johnny Padolka just broke that record, and it's um, um, like 800 and something days. Um, anyway, this is our formal picture. You get to have a formal picture, but there's also an informal picture. This is the informal one. <laughs> As you can tell, there's a bit of a Star Trek theme going along on here. So they lined this up. You know, I think they match this up pretty well with the Star Trek uh, picture. There's only one one thing. Um, you know, first of all, um, we're missing the attractive communication officer. Didn't line up. I think we're missing track of anybody actually, but um, <laughs> there you have it. 
it's really, you know, it's unfortunate that right now we don't have a way to launch. Um, the idea that the shuttle capability went away before we had something else ready to go on the launch, launch pad, you know, it's kind of it's devastating. You know, the right way for things to have happened would have been to retire the shuttle or have the next vehicle ready to go, you know, the day you retire the shuttle. And that, and that would be the day you retire when the next thing launches. But it didn't work out that way. The next, the next vehicle got derailed and the shuttle retirement, you know, uh, continued. Um, the, what actually happened, right, the Columbia, Columbia accident happened. Um, the shuttle program continued, tried to address as best as possible the problems that we had, you know, with, you know, uh, to prevent, uh, you know, another problem like that where a tile comes off the damages part of the spacecraft, which is, you know, an issue for uh, safe reentry. And um, so they decided that we do everything possible to address that problem, be able to deal with the problem and fix something if it happened on orbit. Um, but we do it until the space station is, uh, is assembled and built. So um, after that point, they were not willing to take the risk. And so in other words, the risk to fly this was much higher than was really acceptable. We continued until the space station was built and then put an end to it. So um, that's essentially what happened. So we're waiting now for the next vehicle, of course, and that will be a commercial vehicle, as you, as you probably know, and I'll show you some pictures later. Anyway, let me show you what the launch is like.
pieces, some of the pieces didn't even exist when other pieces were already flown, let alone being in different countries. Um, so we all had to fit together in space for the first time. And so this is the first time we see it all together, and it's amazing. It's just huge. Um, I was talking to students earlier today. You know, this truss is, is 360 feet. It's 120 meters long, this truss. It's, it's more than a football field or a soccer field. Um, this direction, it's almost that, that distance. Um, here, you know, at some times we have up to six visiting vehicles at the same time. When I was there, the, you know, last time there were six. Uh, this happens to be a uh, European ATV, uh, it's called an automatic, automated transfer vehicle, cargo vehicle. Um, uh, you have Progress, Russian Progress cargo vehicles, Russian Soyuz vehicles, the shuttle, um, and you can have now Japanese modules and SpaceX modules. And so it's amazing, uh, you know, um, the kind of traffic you can have up there. Uh, these solar panels are um, about 120 feet from tip to tip, so 40 meters or so, a little less from tip to tip. Um, so it's absolutely massive. Now the funny thing about this picture, though, does anyone see what's funny about this picture? Yeah, the space shuttle's attached, so who took this picture, <laughs> right? Um, so how do we get this picture? Well, what actually happened is we, we actually don't usually um, have any way, we don't usually fly another vehicle around the space station when the shuttle is there. We wouldn't do that because we didn't want um, another vehicle to fire its thrusters at the shuttle, aimed at the shuttle, um, without analyzing everything about that and making sure it was okay. So we wouldn't normally do that. But this was an opportunity. Uh, there was a six-person station crew up there at the time. Three were supposed to leave. Our, our launch was delayed. And so they decided they would go ahead and they would leave during our time on orbit. So we start off with 12 on orbit, and then three of them left in the middle of one night. And so what we actually did was, so they, they analyzed it. They finally approved it. And what we actually did was, in order to get this picture, we, um, we maneuvered the space station in the middle of the night to get the right angles, which is very expensive, by the way, to maneuver the space station around. Um, but it's the only time we've ever had an opportunity to take a picture like this. Um, you're looking at, you know, 240,000 pound, 120 ton, you know, spaceship, space shuttle, and a uh, million pound, or almost 500, you know, uh, ton space station together at one time. So, Mr. Houston on the big loop board, Cali Ho with the station. Initiating RPM on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. Beautiful. 
module. And the other side is the European Research Module, uh, which, I'm, which you can't see anymore. And now I'm going through the, uh, the note, and then the U.S. Laboratory, and another note, the interconnected notes, have modules in different directions. That's the laboratory, still right there. And that's a space setup box. I guess the airlock is locked this way to do spacewalks. And this is going back now into the Russian side of the space station. These are all your engineers, by the way. Um, they're full. And uh, this has kind of become a storage sort of area. And then all the way in the back is where the uh, Russian party space station is. It's the command and control center for the Russians. Lots of computers, some windows here, lots of cameras on the wall. And uh, so now, going forward, this is uh, where I slept. It's a little, you know, a little bit kind of the size of a phone book. And, uh, but enough to put a nice sticking bag on the wall. I have a computer in there. Lots of personal effects. We have to do about two and a half hours of exercise every day to try to maintain our bone and muscle mass all up there. Some of it was uh, resistive exercise, some of it's aerobic exercise. And um, we also, uh, you'll see we have a treadmill. We have a very heavy bungee on the harness that pulls you down. It really hurts to do this, but it's really valuable to do it. Um, you know, and it's like camping in a lot of ways. You have to learn how to do things that you have to do every day, but learn how to do them differently in space. Obviously, uh, after a lot of practice, you get really fast at it. So, obviously, you know, one of the most important things we're doing on the space station is science. Uh, when I was there, we were building the space station. It was very hard to do a lot of science while you were building, setting up, maintaining the space station. As I said, for example, the Japanese module, I was building, assembling all the science equipment and testing it out. Um, so nevertheless, I got about 25% uh, of my time done uh, uh, spent on science, which was, which was a record at the time. Um, but there's different kinds of science we can do. So, first of all, you know, there's the science outside. Uh, obviously, we're at a really good vantage point to look at the Earth. It's actually much better than, than a lot of the automated satellites. Uh, we can get different angles, uh, different lighting. Uh, and so, what we get from mission control is a sequence of, of opportunities every day as we're flying around the Earth and we're, we're targeting certain points around the Earth and monitoring them and monitoring how they change over time, whether the change is due to uh, human uh, effects or whether it's for other reasons. We're monitoring and, and, and you know, noticing the changes. Um, I took over 22,000 pictures in space, and uh, we continue to do this to monitor these important ecological sites. Um, but it's also just beautiful to take pictures. The Earth is amazing. It keeps changing over time. You always see something spectacular out there. I got a lot of pictures of hurricanes um, and uh, you know, the Himalayas and, and China. And uh, it's just unbelievable. And, and parts of um, um, you know, the, uh, the Andes and Chile, just amazing, amazing things. There's a few interesting things where, where people change the surface of the earth. You know, in uh, Dubai, how they built those palm islands? You know, does anyone know what I'm talking about? You know, they built those, those, those palm. You can see those from space. I didn't know about it until. 
until I was in space. So I looked around and I saw this decorated palm tree on the earth. No where the heck is that? How did that get there? So it's amazing. You can see some things like that. But um, uh, the other thing outside the space station is you know, so looking up and looking down. So obviously it's a great platform for doing certain types of astronomy and studying the space environment. Um, this is the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer I mentioned that we brought up on our flight. So this was built by 16 countries. It was a decade-long project. It's run out of CERN. Um, the PI for it was a Nobel uh, laureate from MIT, Professor Ting. Uh, we spent time in CERN with all the physicists to learn everything about, you know, how they wanted us to take care of this device as we installed it. Um, you know, one of the things that we do in terms of, you know, setting things up on the space station is fly this giant robotic arm to install and attach things. Uh, I was flying the robotic arm with one of my crewmates. Uh, the commander, Mark Kelly, was holding his breath the whole time because this thing's $2 billion. <laughs> it's one thing to look at. It's like, it's like flying a video game, but what's hanging on the end of it is $2 billion. So it changes the perspective a little bit. Um, we've got it installed. It works beautifully. Um, so what this thing is doing is it's looking at cosmic rays. It's basically, um, you know, it's looking at radiation from space, right, from deep space. As particles come through this thing, it's able to detect the mass and, you know, the energy, the direction, and, um, and, and try to understand, the, the, you know, and, and characterize the background radiation. Um, in particular, it's looking for characteristics of, of dark matter and also antimatter. So it's looking for understanding the balance of uh, matter and antimatter um, in the universe. Um, it's been working beautifully. The, it turns out that it's, I've been kind of waiting to hear results. I know they've got some extremely high energy particles, much higher, obviously, than you can, uh, you know, create in, in, uh, in an accelerator. But um, uh, they've been very careful about the release of results because, as Professor Ting says, he says, if we announce something that from this, that's not, you know, we're not absolutely, absolutely sure. I mean, statistically, you know, it could set, they could set the course of physics in a certain direction for the next 50 years until we can have something else like this that's better and doing the same thing. So uh, they've been very careful about their releasing results, but by all accounts, it's working really, really well. Um, but the point is, we have a lot of things actually outside that are able to study the space environment, and that's one of the uh, advantages of being there. But most of those things are not controlled by the crew. Those things are mostly controlled by their own centers and their own communication links. Uh, on board the space station inside, you know, the crew is doing research all the time, as much as we can. And there's a lot of facilities, dozens of, of rack facilities. This one happens to be a glove box. Uh, you can put experiments in there of different kinds. I was doing a fluid physics experiment um, during the mission uh, when I was there with this one. But each of the modules have these different facilities. Some are for fluid, some are for uh, biological experiments, some are for materials, uh, some of them are for protein crystal growth. Um, uh, some of them are um, uh, a lot of different things. I'll show you some, a couple examples here. Um, one thing I wanted to mention was, you know, what's really amazing about zero gravity is we are so used to living in a 1G environment and it's always exactly 1G. We kind of take for granted how things are going to behave and it's almost hard to imagine how things could behave differently even if the gravity changed. Um, for, for personally, I can't imagine how a gene could decide that it's going to express itself differently because it's in zero gravity. How does a, how is a molecule in a fluid even know that it's in, one, in, in gravity or not in gravity? But as it turns out, gene expression is really different in zero gravity. And we've been able to identify that, don't really know why, but we're able to take advantage of that, and so we've been able to develop some vaccines taking advantage of this. This is, a, this is a salmonella, and we've developed vaccines for salmonella, as well as take advantage of that property to develop other vaccines. Um, of course, there's a lot of experiments on us, right? We, we are subjects. Human physiology and understanding how the space environment affects us is a big part of what we're doing, especially because NASA wants to be able to go much further than low Earth orbit, and so this is a real focus of, uh, of the science we're doing. Um, fluid physics, um, understanding, you know, um, the properties of fluids and, and zero gravity, wetting properties. Um, there's been some interesting, interesting um, work on, on um, pumpless uh, systems, moving fluids around by changing the shape of the cavity um, and using the wetting properties of the fluid rather than an actual uh, pump or motor that requires maintenance or, or energy. Um, combustion physics, without, the, without gravity, the convection is different for flames, and one of the things that they've been able to, um, uh, one thing that's been a very interesting area of research is uh, very low temperature combustion, um, which could have implications for combustion processes on Earth to make things more fuel efficient, more uh, uh, to burn cleaner. Um, we have experiments outside as well, 
also, this is a platform. It's called MISI. It's Material Investigation in Space Something. Um, but basically, it's a platform where you can put all kinds of samples on it and expose it to space. So those samples could be everything from silicon chips to uh, paint coatings for protection to live samples, live cells, uh, you know, or, or, or vegetable material, um, anything you want to study, semiconductors, photovoltaics, uh, and you want to see how well it behaves, not only in the radiation environment, but the vacuum environment, the electromediate environment, it's a very harsh environment, and you can study that over a period of time, bring it back in, and, um, and examine it later. Um, obviously, we're doing biological experiments, trying to grow, uh, grow things in space, seeing how, um, how plants behave in a certain gravity environment, and ultimately we want to optimize that to be able to grow our own food in space. Uh, we did grow some of our own food and ate it, which was a small experiment, but you know, we did it. Um, there's various robots on the space station. Uh, one of my favorite experiments um, has to do with these robot spheres right here. Do you remember um, uh, in Star Wars when Luke Skywalker is trying to learn how to fight with a lightsaber? And he's got that little droid that flies around, you know, and he's got the, you can't see it, and it's going around, and he's trying to, trying to hit it. Uh, these things are just like that. They fly around inside the space station. They're programmable. Uh, we use them to, to try to um, analyze uh, new control systems for automa automatic docking, rendezvous and docking, tracking, formation flying, things like that that are, would be applicable to satellites flying outside the space station for inspection or for large, with large antenna arrays, things like that. And we can do experiments on them inside the space station. I'll tell you more about that, I think, in a minute. Um, we've learned a lot about the immune system, how it's affecting us. A lot of studies have to do with this. I'm not an expert in this area, but I understand they've learned a lot about immunology and the possible you know, uh, useful, useful um, studies that will help understand how to address uh, immunosuppression uh, issues. One of the really neat things that's come out of this, um, and you're probably, you might, I hope, see some of this uh, on your own uh, soon, is there was something that we developed in space to make uh, very small bubbles. And those bubbles could encapsulate a drug you could use these very small bubbles to deliver the drug to somewhere in, in the body, so it would only be it would only be you know, effective where, it's, where you're actually targeting it. Uh, so this has been very successful. After they did it in space, they were able to figure out using the same you know, based on techniques and analysis in space, we're able to figure out how to do it on the ground. And now it's going through some trials for a cancer treatment. Um, but even something more spectacular with this is diabetes. Um, through this method, um, they figured out that if they have a patch basically a patch on your skin that would be used to control insulin levels in your blood. The, the issue with it without this technology is your body, you know, basically rejects, it rejects the infection. Um, with this encapsulation, the body doesn't see what's going on, and these things can move freely through the body, and by basically having a patch on your skin, um, you're able to develop a, a mechanism for controlling insulin levels using this technology. It could be the end of diabetes. Um, a number of years, that's what they're, they're saying, would be, would be amazing um, outcome. So I do want to say something about this. Uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed um, experiments with these, and, and um, I came back, these, these, these things came from MIT, and, I, and this is us basically in space launching a competition. I, I told MIT this would be a great high school competition to have kids program these robots have them compete and then fly in space on the space station. So MIT created this program. It's been running five years now. And the students basically uh, compete in a simulation game. Um, and then uh, they form up um, teams together in alliances. And the alliances compete in space. And for half a day, the crew on board runs, the, runs these things. And the, kid, and the students get to watch their algorithms run on the space station. Um, it's been really, really neat. We're getting Australia involved. Um, we got Canada, uh, Russia, Europe. Uh, the U.S., of course, um, started this, and Mexico and Israel, and this year, when it's in Australia, starting up, we've got 10 high school teams here. Um, if you guys are interested in this in your high school, um, you know, find a way to contact me about art at the university, um, because we would love to encourage more kids to do this. Let me show you uh, someone who can say better um, how cool this is.
right. So, as I said, on this mission, um, you know, one of the really special things about this last mission of Endeavour was finishing uh, the construction of the space station. Um, we installed uh, AMS, which you saw earlier, and um, so there was, uh, I got to do two spacewalks on this last mission, and as it turned out, by chance, I was on the very last spacewalk of space station construction, which was also the very last one of the space shuttle program. And I went out first on that one, which means I came in last. And um, so that's the hatch right there that we come in. This was my second spacewalk. And um, it's just an incredible thing that we can do this. Uh, it turned out to build the space station. It was a th about 1,000 hours of spacewalking time. We crossed that 1,000 hour mark during this last spacewalk. Um, we patched the very last piece. And then we got to announce to all the control centers, you know, the space station assembly is complete. Congratulate everybody around the world. Um, it was an amazing, uh, amazing moment to be there. Um, especially because I've been working on this since I was a student, um, working on PowerPoint slides and propulsion, you know, uh, algorithms um, before anything existed, any hardware existed at all. One of the cool things is, you know, when you come out of that airlock, this airlock faces the ground. And, you know, in the swimming pool where we practice, that airlock faces the bottom of the pool. And it's probably about this high up the bottom of the pool. So if you, if you come down to the bottom of the pool, you kind of touch that, that ring. You know, so we're pretty used to practicing going out that hanging off that ring, the bottom of the pool is right there. But when you do it in space, you're looking at the Earth 400 kilometers below your feet. You see your feet and then you see the Earth, the whole thing. You know, you see the blackness all around it and you're hanging on there. And this, and this is literally the bottom of the space station. So, you, you know, it sort of feels like if you're hanging on the bottom wheel, of, you know, on the wheel of a 747, the whole space station is above you. It's the last thing, you know. Um, and you're hanging on that and the next thing is the whole planet. Uh, seeing the planet with your, with your own eyes, you know, it, it's amazing. It's the biggest thing, you know, obviously you've ever seen. But uh, just the confirmation in your own mind that, you know, yes, it's a big, big giant ball just floating, just like you are floating in the emptiness. It's just, just unbelievable. But it's an amazing thing we do, and we have this thing called translation adaptation because, you know, in the pool with water, right, and with water you have buoyancy, right, so you have your weight and you have your buoyancy, and that, and there's a buoyancy torque. If the center of gravity and the center of buoyancy are in the same place, you have a torque. But you're always fighting that torque. You know, anything you try to do, you're fighting this, this buoyancy torque. And uh, the other thing is, when you move, you have some drag to the water. And so anything you do, you'll, you'll, by yourself, you'll slow down. Right? But in space, it's different because, first of all, you don't have that buoyancy torque. Right? So you're, you know, you're always rotating around this, your center. And the other thing is, space doesn't, you know, it's quite the opposite, that nothing will stop unless you stop it. So it's very funny to watch a beginner, a yeah, space walker, because they'll be out there and they'll be doing the smallest thing like this, and their feet will be going all over the place over here like this, because there's nothing restricting them. Um, so we have a chance to practice translating, basically, you know, for a few minutes to get used to that, to be able to, because you have to walk with your hands and work with your hands. You know. um, but just an amazing thing. I came out, that's me on the, uh, on the truss here, and this is a small part of the space station. We can get a sense of scale. That's, uh, that's one of my crewmates, Drew. And I'm right in the middle there. And uh, I, when I came up there, I don't even know who took this picture, but I came up over here, and then I saw the low rise right in front of me. And it just, it just incredible to be out there with you know, the, the panoramic view you have in the, in the space suit. So let me show you a little bit about that last spacewalk um, of Space Station Assembly. Welcome back to uh, Open Space and Taz. Uh, congratulations on being the 201st human being to uh, be in outer space. I waited a long time to say those words to you. Congratulations. Thanks, Big. Thank you. You know, it's a dream come true for me. Ninja Ballerina Grip. 
behalf of the STS-134 crew and the Expedition 27 crew, Space Station assembly is complete. This uh, Space Station, the pinnacle of human achievement and uh, international cooperation, and now it's the brightest star in the sky and hopefully the doorstep to our future. to have habitats is, um, you know, in deep space or, uh, you know, I think this picture, I think this is the Mars one, the guys want to go to Mars and I've never come back. I think that's, uh, that's their design right there. So ultimately, the, the, the goal is to develop um, the capability to go to Mars and, uh, and that's what we're working on. So, you know, we start off this whole thing talking about the dream of flight, the dream of space flight. What's the next dream? You know, the next dream is really to have a human presence beyond Earth, really on other, on other, on other places in the solar system. And are we ready to do that? You know, are we ready? Um, and I guess I put it to you that we're already there. Uh, this, is, um, this is the picture from a window on the Japanese module. I slept by this window every night while I was on the last mission. And it's a spectacular view. It's looking sideways. The space station's flying forward. This is looking sideways. And so you get this perspective. You get the, the stars the stars in the sky. And you know the Earth's limb, and I would stare at this. I would stare at this view out the window, and, and I'd be hard to close. It was a blind, sort of a shutter. I'd be hard to close it and finally go to bed because I just could stare at that all day long. But it's amazing what we have in space. The space station is huge. It's an unbelievable little thing that we've assembled in space, and and it's and it's there. It works beautifully, and and we live on it. And it's it's really a lot. You know, I don't know some of you might have seen the flyover last night. The space station. It's a home. I mean, for those of us who lived on it, it feels like home. It doesn't feel like a strange place we visit and have an unusual experience. After a few months on the space station, you can't remember what gravity is like. It, that feels like what's, it's normal. Gravity is an option. <laughs> and what's down here is, is one version of that option. Um, so it's, it's really a, it's a, it's a, it's a human life. It's a human existence up there. There's going to be a lot more people in space in the future, and it'll be a perfectly normal thing to spend time up there. Um, so. You know, this is, um, I think the capability to do this is the legacy of the space shuttle program, um, building the space station, the international relations we formed. It's been called, you know, one of the uh, most difficult engineering projects of all time. But the, one of the biggest successes is the international collaboration. We've learned how to build really big things in space and do them well with uh, spacewalking and robotics, you know, as, as key components have been able to do that. We've been adapting to living up there. We still have a lot to learn about human adaptation, but we are learning and, and doing the experiments to learn about how to, how to adapt to be able to up there longer. And we've been developing all the technology from life support and power systems. 
systems and trying out new technology. The space station is an amazing test bed to try all this technology and see if it works. And then recycling, um, you know, the air and the water on the space station and learning how to maintain these systems um, in a real environment. Um, and that, that we'll be able to use that as we go forward. So, so what do we do? How do we go forward from here? We need you guys. You guys are the next generation of scientists and engineers. You're the ones who are going to make this dream come true. Um, you're the best and the brightest, as Professor Russell said at the beginning. And um, you are the leaders who are going to take us forward and, and make this dream come true. So we're really counting on you to do that. Um, follow your dreams. And, uh, and we really hope that you can make our dreams, all of our dreams, come true. Before I end, I just want to leave you with one thought. Um, this is um, the very last uh, um, view we had outside on the space station before we came in on that last spacewalk. And, you know, it's an incredible thing. Um, this is not a science fiction movie. This is a, this is a massive thing that, that we built. We just finished building it at the moment of, of taking this picture um, outside. And you can see, you know, um, about 120, about uh, 1.2 million pounds of hardware in space, you know, beautifully flying over the Earth below. Uh, when you see it, it looks like it belongs there. It looks like a bird, you know, and um, but we're, we're um, um, you know, you feel like you're in the middle of a movie, you know, when you see something, when you see this, you know, this is the view I had from my visor, taking a picture with a camera right in front of me. Um, but to me, the space station is magic. All this stuff seems like magic. And so I just want to leave you with um, a little bit of that magic. Okay, Richard, here we are. This is our Japanese life form propagator modulator right here. A life form propagator yeah. modulator? Well, yeah. what the heck does it do? Well, you can almost imagine. Why don't you take a look under there and I'll, okay. I'll go up here and yeah. just, uh, you know, I'll take a look inside. Here. And, you know, okay. Hang on the walls. No, nothing. Yeah. Well, I'll give you the controls and uh, I'll let you activate the controls. Ooh. Is, it, is it dangerous? Is it going to hurt? kind of looks like alien technology, doesn't it? It does. Can you seal it up? Yeah, help me bring this down. Okay. My commander, um, Mike, he can't stand when I do this. You'll see. He's going to be pissed. Why, why would that he's be? He's going to be pissed. <laughs> why would he be pissed? You'll see. Okay, so press this button? Press, press the button that says energize. Energize. Yeah. <laughs> Done! Right. Dang it! Jam it oh. off! Uh-oh. How many times <laughs> I told you? Don't <laughs> feed me a board. Sorry, Mike. I was Mike. busy. Sorry, I was... I was really... You! Oh, hey, 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 I, I was, was just visiting. I was I just getting the tour, man. Oh, the you have the, the control tour. panel. You know oh, I yeah. have to demonstrate he the modulator. He told me to do it. Mike, we have some guests here on board today. Oh, hi, everybody. And uh, I want to say welcome. And thanks for coming aboard the space station, where every day we make the impossible possible. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.